representative of each letter of the alphabet for Oconee County subjects and that'll carry us uh, with guest speakers, workshops, classes, um, presentations and activities throughout the rest of the year. So keep an eye out. Um, the next one, C is for Cherokee. We're going to do a lunch and learn for that next Thursday. That's March 12th and they'll be right here in this room at 12:30. So bring your lunch. Uh, Dr. Dave Levere will be giving a presentation about Cherokee history and culture here in Oconee, and he always does a great job, and it will be a nice relaxed uh, event that day. And we've got plans for D, E, and F uh, in April, so uh, if you're not on our mailing list and you want to be, leave me your email address uh, today and we'll add you to it so you can get our monthly calendar of events and our monthly e-newsletters as well. So, uh, And also follow us on Facebook, that's the best way uh, to stay up to date with what we're doing here. Um, also, if you're interested in other events, uh, next Friday night, uh, March 13th, we have Trivia Night. It's a monthly program we've been doing once a month. Uh, that'll be at 7 o'clock for teams of anywhere from 1 to 8 people. It's just a fun time. It's not history-based. We do lots of other topics. Uh, we have food and snacks and uh, just have a good time. It's family-friendly, so if you want to bring your kids, that's fine. Uh, and then if you're into stitching, if you knit, crochet, uh, cross stitch, anything like that, uh, come out for our stitching together group. Uh, we meet twice a month, every second and fourth Saturday uh, from 1 o'clock on, uh, whatever seems comfortable, and just work on our own projects but together. So we're not all working on the same thing, but we share our skills and our ideas and uh, just have a good time. So that'll be this month, March 14th and 28th. So without further ado, B is for borders. Uh, if you got to check out the uh, Shaping of South Carolina exhibit prior to this, uh, I hope you enjoyed it. If you have questions, please ask us. Uh, it'll be here until August 1st, so bring your families back, check it out. Uh, it's got some really high quality uh, maps. They're original. They might not look like it. They're such good quality, <laughs> but uh, very generous from the South Carolina uh, Historical Society that we've got this here. So uh, B is for Borders, and we've got uh, Alan John Zupan of the South Carolina Geodetic Commission here for this. And just a little bit about him. He earned a bachelor's degree in geology at the University of Wisconsin and a master's degree in geological oceanography at Texas A&M University. Uh, he began working with the South Carolina Geological Survey in 1973. Uh, in 1995, he joined the South Carolina Geodetic Survey where he's primarily worked on boundaries, uh, state boundaries, county boundaries, and even cities. So, glad to have him and bring him on up. And, uh, thanks for coming. Thank you. granted the Lord's proprietors the colony of Carolina, which stretched what was from now would be the border of Georgia and Florida all the way to up to Virginia and North Carolina and over to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, in 1664, the first uh, town was founded in the colony up in Albemarle on the coast of uh, North Carolina. And in 1670, the city of Charleston, Charleston was founded. And shortly after that, they started referring to North and South Carolina as two distinct areas of the colony. Uh, by 1690s, uh, there was a push to separate the two areas formally, uh, basically for the administrative tasks that were necessary. It was a little hard to do the northern part and southern part, all of which was all from Charleston at that time. 
uh, also the collection of taxes and duties. Uh, nothing happened in that regard, however, until uh, 1729 when the uh, king bought out the Lord proprietors and Carolina became a royal colony. Uh, 1732 was another was a factor. Georgia was founded as a colony, which cut out a large section of what, the, what was South Carolina, what would be South Carolina at that time. So, um, and then 1735, there was an agreement between North Carolina, uh, South Carolina, and the King for creating the first section of the boundary. Uh, the King and the two colonies, North and South Carolina. Uh, agreed that the boundary would start on the uh, Atlantic coast, about 30 miles southwest of the uh, Cape Fear River, that's the west uh, side of the Cape Fear River. It would go northwestward until it reached the 35th parallel and then continue westward to the Pacific Ocean. So you see, we did lose a lot of territory from that time until now. So, uh, First surveys were done, it was started in 1735, and they were supposed to go up to the 35th parallel, as was mentioned. Uh, the surveying took three years because uh, there was a lot of surveying going on through swamps, bad areas. Also, the commissioners and surveyors didn't get paid sometimes, so they would quit. And until they got paid, uh, they would stay off the job and then come back once they got paid again. Uh, for some reason, they stopped at this point rather than actually getting up to the 35th parallel. We have no record. We have no record to say why they stopped up there. Uh, it's about 12 miles short of the 35th degree of latitude. And the plat indicates, however, they did believe that they had reached the 35th parallel. They put a stake or a light would not there uh, and stated on the plat they had reached the 35th degree of latitude. But again, why they stopped there, we have no idea. Um, after, by about 1763, 1764, settlers had uh, gotten to west of the end point of the boundary, and uh, it was decided that the boundary should be continued to the west from, that, from uh, westward. And uh, the king, for some reason, the king's instructions say that if 35th parallel had not been reached by the original surveys, they should continue the survey up to the 35th parallel and then go westward. But the surveyors ignored that for some reason. Again, they, they accepted this as the 35th parallel and uh, one other factor in here, in 1763 there was a treaty in Augusta that created the uh, Catawba Indian Reservation and that was surveyed early in 1764. Uh, uh, surveying later on in 1764, did this section of the line. Uh, Samuel Wiley surveyed, I uh, was one of the surveyors for the Catawba uh, Indian Reservation, and he was also on the surveying team that surveyed the 1764 line. And once they reached the Salisbury Road, Wiley knew that they were on in the wrong spot. They were not on the 35th parallel because if they were on the 35th parallel, they would not have hit the Salisbury Road because it was inside the Catawba Indian Reservation. And they would have hit the Catawba Indian <coughs> Reservation boundary before they hit the Salisbury Road. So they decided to stop the Salisbury Road and end the survey there. Onward. This area is sort of a no man's land. Uh, became a no man's land. Uh, both South Carolina and North Carolina uh, handed out land grants in the area. Um, when tax collectors from North Carolina came down to collect taxes. People say we're living in South Carolina. When the South Carolina tax collectors went up, they said we're living in North Carolina. So it's sort of nobody knew anything. <coughs> another another factor in here too is where was Andy Jackson born? South Carolina, North Carolina. When was Andrew Jackson born? 1767. There is no boundary in North South Carolina at this particular time. He was born in the Waxhaw area. Um, he was born actually when his mother was returning from uh, burying his father. And 
uh, not sure which, where the wax off area is. If they could pinpoint that, we could tell you now, based upon the present boundary, which state he was born in, but at that time, it was in South Carolina, the North Carolina boundary in that area. So in 1772, they noticed we, South Carolina lost some territory here, not getting up to the 35th parallel. So in 1772, South Carolina and North Carolina agreed to this boundary where it gave land back to uh, South Carolina. They followed the Salisbury Road up to the Catawba Indian Reservation, around the Catawba Indian Reservation, to the Catawba River, up the Catawba River, to the North Fork of the Catawba River, and then westward to what at that time was the 1772 Cherokee boundary between uh, Carolinas and uh, the Cherokee Nation. Uh, Along came the Revolutionary War. Nothing happened for a little while. And, but this era back in 1737 continued to create uh, contention between North and South Carolina. And in 1808, two states sent representatives and met in Columbia, South Carolina to resolve the issue. They, the representatives agreed to three articles. Number one article was that what had been surveyed up to 1772 would be the permanent boundary. That would be the accepted permanent boundary. Number two is that the Salisbury Road uh, would be surveyed as a straight line from the end of the 1764 up to the Catawba Indian Reservation at 12 Mile Creek. This is because Salisbury Road was a dirt road. And you know what happens to dirt roads? They wander back and forth depending upon what's being used. So that meant the boundary changed as the road changed. So they wanted to fix the boundary. So that was the second article that was agreed to. And the third article was that they would uh, start at 1772 and, and go along the ridge line until they hit the 35th parallel, uh, where, until they hit where Blue Ridge met the 35th parallel, and then go down to the Chattooga River. The trouble is, the Blue Ridge never reaches the bridge line. I mean, it does not reach the 35th parallel. It stops north of the uh, 35th parallel along that bridge line. So, and then it took a little while for everybody to agree to everything and get things agreed to in final form. Along came the War of 1812, so nothing was done. Uh, 1813, uh, the section between, again, uh, the end of the 1764 survey and uh, the Catawba Indian Reservation was surveyed in. And also at this time on the uh, section that would need to be done, they did some reconnaissance because that area, this, that area just was unknown geographically what was over there. So they were doing some reconnaissance to try and figure out what to do. And they had to do some adjustments to what was agreed to, but that was finally uh, settled. And in 1815, last, uh, section of the South Carolina North Carolina boundary was surveyed in. Um, it followed, it went westward from the end for about four miles in a straight line, hit the ridge line, followed the ridge line until it hit the uh, uh, Cherokee Indian boundary and set that was there in 1797 and then went to about the 35th parallel of the Chattanooga River. So this entire boundary was marked by trees. There were half marks on trees or blaze marks on trees. There were a few stones that were set, a few rocks that were set. There was one set at the corner at the 1813 uh, survey. There was a stone that was set at the end of 1772 that replaced the red oak tree. There were a few stones that were set along the ridge line. Uh, and then the, uh, there was a stone at the end of the Chattooga River. This is what blaze marks look like on trees, just hacking up the tree. This is a a uh, tree that's on a boundary, and the boundary runs through the tree, so there's an identical place mark on the other side of the tree. This is more of a witness tree to uh, one of the boundary trees. But that is how the boundary was marked. And no other permanent marks were set since that time when these were marked. These are the stones that I mentioned. This is the one at uh, 1813 stone, how that was set. In 1984, a truck hit it because it was right next to the road, broke it apart. One in Lancaster County 
and highway engineers collected the pieces, put them in a warehouse. They, uh, later on, they reassembled the stone and put it back. You notice there's now a cage sitting around it because it's still the road. It's fairly well made, close to the road. Uh, this is a stone Benson Gap Turnpike um, that uh, had South Carolina on one side, North Carolina on the other side. Uh, and this is another, uh, these are two stones, one on the north side of Benson's Road, the other side on the, other, on the south side of South Carolina's north side of North Carolina. These were all covered with moss, and it took a while to find those. Benson's Road, where, where is that in relation to the state? It's uh, Greenville, above Greenville area. Um, sort of, that's pretty, pretty places to lie camp up there. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's just west, just west of there. Uh, I mentioned, again, the original boundary is supposed to be at 35th north latitude. Notice if that had held, what South Carolina would be missing as far as geography is concerned. You wouldn't have Caesar's head. Uh, actually, the Blue Ridge comes down right about in here. Uh, you wouldn't have Caesar's head. Sassafras Mountain would not be the highest place in the state. The highest place in the state would be in Oconee County. It'd be uh, about seven tenths of a mile west of 107 at uh, the spur of Ellicott Mountain that comes down from North Carolina, which is 3,000 feet. And Sassafras was 3,553 feet. So. Again, this is a completed boundary of the original surveys. Uh, there were some historical resurveys that were done. One was done in 1905 between Marlborough County, uh, South Carolina, and Scotland, and Richmond County, North Carolina. I'll talk about that a little more later. And then there was another one done uh, between Horry County, South Carolina, and Columbus and Brunswick County, North Carolina in 1928. Uh, in early 70s there was some interest in the mid 70s uh, 1970s about uh, drilling for oil and gas off the continental shell uh, and so therefore the states along the east coast had to uh, make sure their offshore boundaries were in shape and north carolina and south carolina established their offshore boundary and that was done in 1978 the congress approved that in 1981 Uh, we started having some jurisdictional problems in the Gaston County and Charlotte, uh, Charlotte area as far as the boundary and uh, in the North Carolina Geodetic Survey and South Carolina Geodetic Survey signed a memorandum of agreement that we would start to reestablish the boundary in order to uh, get rid of these conflicts. But, and the reason we did this is that back in 1977, there was a shrimper from Hilton Head Island that was shrimping off the mouth of the Savannah River. And Georgia Wildlife officials were a boat, arrested him, and were taking he and his boat back to Savannah because they said he was shrimping in, Georgia, in Georgian waters. He overpowered the wildlife officials, locked them in the cabin of his boat, took them back to Hilton Head Island. Governor Edwards refused to extradite him to Georgia because he said that the boundary was in question at the mouth of the Savannah River. So Georgia sued South Carolina, South Carolina in the, U in the U.S. Supreme Court, South Carolina countersued. Uh, it went, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court uh, uh, signed it to a, a master in equity to make the decision on what the situation should be. Uh, he made his ruling, neither state agreed, and they went ahead and solved it on their own by 1996. And if the uh, Congress finally approved the uh, boundary in, I think it was uh, 2001, something like that, and the Supreme Court signed off on it a year or two later. That seven miles of boundary cost $10 million to do because of the litigation involved. We wanted to avoid this. We wanted to avoid litigation, so we were, that's why we signed a memorandum of agreement to work on it. What happened to Trump? Pardon? The Trump vote captain. What happened to him? Did he go to jail? No. Oh, no. No, he never went to jail. In fact, he only died. How did he die? Two years ago. No. He didn't go to jail. 
Governor Edwards and I both knew that. Um, so, anyway. Um, so we were going to begin to work in the Charlotte area, but then something came along. Duke Energy wanted to sell the Chapassi Gorges acreage to South Carolina, North Carolina, and this was in 1995, 40,000 acres of South Carolina. So Duke asked North Carolina, where's the state boundary? We don't know. Yeah, South Carolina. We don't know. So I read somewhere, I read in, in some uh, references that uh, plants had been created in the 1815 boundary. And um, so I went to the South Carolina archives to look for the plant, see if they had it. They didn't have it according to their records and so forth. Nobody knew anything about it. Um, went to North Carolina archives, they didn't have anything. So I went back to the South Carolina archives, and a friend of mine there, Mary Chandler, is very good. And Marion said, well, Alan, I think I might have seen something that you might be interested in. I don't know, though. Three weeks later, he came back and called me and told me he had get something probably what I needed. Um, it had been just thrown in a drawer somewhere and not cataloged. It was a, and this was a Jukassi Gorges area that we were working in, but it was a 19-foot long flat. This was the 1815 flat survey. This was the Chatuka River on the sand. This is the straight line that goes up to, uh, it's about a five mile straight line that goes up around Indian Camp Mountain. This follows a ridge line and it hits a straight section. There's a four mile straight section that goes over to what's present between those parts of the Archives wouldn't let this loose. I took a roll of mylar and traced it so we could use it. Um, but anyway, this is, this was great evidence because there are two factors that one has to consider when you're redoing boundaries, no matter a political boundary particularly, or even a land boundary. You have to try and follow in the footsteps of the original surveyors to the best of your ability, the best, based upon the best evidence available. And this is the best evidence that we can come across or something like this. The second factor is to try and disrupt the society as little as possible when you're doing this. So, we use this to work on the first section uh, that was necessary. This is that 20 mile section going from the Chattooga up to near Indian Camp Mountain. The west end of that 20 miles is what's quote unquote called Ellicott's Rock, which isn't Ellicott's Rock. It's really Commissioner's Rock. Ellicott's Rock is about 19 feet north of uh, Commissioner's Rock. And the west end is, is also a rock uh, that on old USGS, US Geological Survey topographic maps, it's also called Ellicott's Rock for some reason. I have no idea how we did that. But this is, this is Commissioner's Rock, alias Ellicott's Rock. Uh, it has the inscription on it. Uh, this was done in 1813 during the Reconnaissance. And the rocks are up, uh, the inscription is about um, river level usually. There's a steep bank you have to plant it down and get to it. But, uh, that is the west end of the boundary coming on the section. On the east end is a, was another rock that was set in 1813. Um, when TBA was created, before TBA was created, there were some surveys done uh, to create topographic maps so they could plan the entire uh, project. And very accurate uh, coordinates were uh, created for rocks along the uh, ridge line that had been set, and one of those was the rock that was at this point. So we had very accurate coordinates, so we put it in GPS equipment, went out and looked for it. This is what we found. We just found a uh, concrete post and uh, another metal uh, pipe sitting next there marking that particular point. If we think we know where the rock is, we think it's in a fireplace in North Carolina in somebody's house. So but we're not going after it. <laughs> Anyhow, so we, South Carolina and North Carolina agreed based upon the coordinate and this evidence that we would use this as that eastern end point of that 20 mile line. We set a new monument there, a geodetic monument. We named it Blackburn. Blackburn was an astronomer on the 1813 Constance survey um, that was done. 
since we started on West End, we figured we might as well go east, opposite of what they did originally. So we started, and we had the plants, so we did the ridge line as, as our next section. The ridge line is 54 miles long. Uh, South Carolina took the uh, eastern 27 miles, North Carolina took the western 27 miles, we contracted to work out the surveying firms. Um, this is a little closer up of the plant. Along the ridge line, there's 750 what we call calls. And these calls are trees. They survey from tree to tree. And for example, there's a bearing from, a, from this tree, north 66 west, and it goes 13 chains, 50 links, and this tree is a Spanish oak. The next tree, there's bearing to it, north 77 west, seven chains, 50 links, and it's a chestnut oak. There's 750 of those along the ridge line. They're following the top of the ridge line best they can, and that is that is the that is the monument. The top of the ridge line is the monument. The trees are just on the ridge line and are marking that, that monument. So that is what our this is what our surveyors had to work with. We had the records of the distance and bearings and so forth. Of course, they didn't find the trees, and so we uh, but they surveyed the points in. And basically, the ridge line is separating uh, watersheds in North Carolina and South Carolina. This is this is showing the 1815 plat in the area of uh, Panther Mountain. This is the plat that we created that was created in 2000. It's you can see a similar shape in there. Um, we control the surveys by putting in uh, very accurate geodetic control. With, uh, Coordinates. Uh, instead of trees, we have re basically rebars. Besides this, we have the rebars with caps on them. These are caps. They were aluminum caps. If you want something to survive outside, do not use aluminum. We found this out because we went back maybe after four months after putting some of these in, and the ones that were sticking, we buried them, usually we bury them like this, but the ones that were sticking up, all the is chewed, it was gone. And I couldn't figure that out for the longest time. I didn't know what kind of animal had an aluminum deficiency. However, I don't know if, if, if you ever have chain link fences and you got these aluminum ties that hold the chain link to the uh, post and so forth. Squirrels love to chew on that. And it'll drop your chain link off the fence. And they'll chew the little aluminum balls on top of your chain link fence. Because I, I have that happen with my chain link fence. But anyway, squirrels are teeth have to be continue, just like beavers. They have to continue to gnaw something to keep their teeth because they continually grow. So sometimes our caps would only have maybe this little center part on it. So just use something else besides the limit. Okay, back then, in 1815, they used trees to mark the boundary. Of course, the trees aren't there. We use these rods, and these rods can disappear, but now we have coordinates on all these points. So you can enter coordinates for these points into a GPS system, navigate to that point. We don't have to have a physical monument there anymore. You can use the coordinates, navigate GPS, or do regular surveying to get to that point. So this, we hope this is going to last for a long time now because of that situation. Uh, again, I mentioned that one second object of the boundary survey is to upset society as little as possible. Back in 1815, the only person they upset actually was Stephen Morgan when they went through the middle of his house. That was the only building up on the uh, ridge line at that time. These are the remains of Stephen Morgan's house. The chimney had fallen out this direction. When we went through this section, we did not go through, We I think we went through one house. We clipped the few a little bit. We went through one house, uh, Bernard and Martha Leonard's house. And um, this is the uh, mark on one side. If you go through their house, there's another boundary mark on the other side. And Bernie was fond of saying that Martha ate her meals in South Carolina and he ate his in North Carolina because it went right through their kitchen. <laughs> so, uh, at the east end of the um, 1815 survey, there's a stone set. This was at the uh, old block house uh, over there. It was a red oak at the uh, end of the 1772 survey. 
Uh, North Carolina on one side, South Carolina on the other side. Uh, as I mentioned, it's also the northern endpoint of Smart Mercury and Bill Laundry. When Sid Miller, who was uh, head of the GZX survey at that time, and I worked on the Greenville Spartanburg boundary, he went up to uh, look for this stone. Uh, and it was in the middle of the field, it was supposed to be in the middle of the field, and there was a guy bush hogging out there, and Sid couldn't find the stone. So I went over and talked to the fellow about it, to find out maybe some, he knew something about the stone. And he's talking to the fellow, told him what the importance of the stone was that it marked the North Carolina South Carolina boundary. It was the northern endpoint of Spartanburg Greenville. The guy says, I knew they shouldn't have taken it. I knew they shouldn't have taken it. <laughs> Polk County Historical Society came down and took that stone and planted it in the front yard of the Historical Society <laughs> Museum up there. <laughs> Sid went up there to talk with them. They refused to give it back to him. He said, fine, we just moved to South Carolina, North Carolina boundary northward three or four miles. We did get the stone back, and, and we were able to reset it in the same spot because there was a um, uh, later monument that had been set by uh, the U.S. Geological Survey that we were able to reference back to the stone. So uh, again, that's the uh, that was the eastern endpoint of the uh, that section. The next section we did was from again that point where the stone is. And we went eastward until we until we got Lake Wiley. Uh, there was also a stone set at that back in the in the early 1800s, not when the survey was done in 1772, but in the early 1800s. There was a soapstone uh, monument that was set that was about five feet tall, ten inches on the side, and set by 1818 when Governor Dennis was governor of South Carolina. And this is a copy of the plat. Uh, I cut it in the middle, so like, otherwise you wouldn't be able to read anything if I just took a picture of the plat. Again, this is where that stone is on the uh, western end, and this is where it started um, back over at the beginning of the survey on the eastern end. Again, they went up the old Salisbury Road, so they didn't have to survey. They just walked the road until they hit the Catawba Indian Reservation. And they actually just walked around the Catawba Indian Reservation because they could still see the blaze marks and the trees from the Catawba Indian Reservation surveyed eight years earlier. And then hit the, hit the Catawba River, just walked up the river so they, until they hit the North Fork. So they haven't done any surveying so far. When they hit here, and they went westward for 64 miles, and that's when they started surveying. They surveyed 64 miles in seven days. Can you imagine? The accuracy probably of that survey. Anyway, and the way that they marked the survey was every mile they had a mile, what they call a mile tree, and that's what's on the flat. Each one of these little flips on here is a mile tree. It says what type of tree it is. So again, they started surveying over here at Lake Wiley, uh, what was just the Colorado River at that time. Um, at Stone, uh, we got some plats from the Duke Energy's archives and the stone was shown on that, those plats um, before the lake was uh, level covered that area. Uh, the stone was tied to other monuments that are still above, uh, that are still on land, so we were, we were able to calculate geodetically North Carolina and South Carolina calculated a coordinate for this point, came up with the same coordinate for the point, and uh, we had a boat at that time, and we did a hydrographic survey of the area, and um, went to uh, had some divers go down to try and look for the stone. Uh, the first team that went down was York County Rescue Squad as an exercise. They went down and looked for it. It's only 17 feet of water, but it's pitch black five feet down. You can't see anything down there. So they didn't find it. And then we had connections with the National Oceanographic Administration uh, Navigation Response Team. They had some very sophisticated equipment. They came up twice to look for it, and uh, they couldn't find it either. So we accepted that point because both uh, North Carolina and South Carolina had calculated the same coordinate at that point. So we accepted that as the east end point. When the when this was surveyed in 1772. I mentioned that both North Carolina and South Carolina granted 
land in the area. So after the survey, uh, boundary was surveyed, uh, South Carolina re-granted the land in 1772. So I thought that the best way of trying to find some of these old positions for the uh, lime trees, the mild trees, was to go back to the 1772 grants and see if they're mentioned on there, if there are any plots available. And we did find uh, Gene Brantman, who works with Cornerstone Engineering, who's a very excellent uh, land record researcher. Um, we hired her, and she did the research for us. And on some of the grants we did find, this is a 19 mile tree, there's a 22 mile tree there. And then what we tried to do, what they tried to do is lay this over on present maps, uh, topographic maps, and uh, land records maps to see if it fit. And in some cases we could. This is the one that was a 19 mile tree, which is right here. And so we we're able to tie some of these to modern records and to uh, get a present day point for those 1772 trees. We weren't too successful with that 64 miles of tree, uh, it's the 64 trees for the entire survey, but um, after we exhausted this, then we went back to records that were within 50 years, uh, land uh, records that were within 50 years of the 1772 survey, because we probably figured that those would still carry the trees forward, and we used that as uh, filled in a lot of gaps. There were still a few gaps, and we had to use a lot more modern land records to do that section. This is a section where we started getting into conflicts with society. Um, this is what you probably heard about. This is a section. This is Gaston County, York County. This is the gas. This is a gas station, convenience store. The yellow line patterns are the GIS or the computer patterns for property records in Gaston County, North Carolina. The blue are for uh, York County, South Carolina. Notice they overlap. Notice there are gaps. The reason, and it's not the fault of us these days, because over for 200 years, neither state maintained the boundary after those trees died. There were no monuments ever set to, to, to keep that boundary established. So this fellow built the gas station, convenience store in 1994, based upon the fact he was told he was in South Carolina. This was the reestablished boundary based upon historical records. This is a very good point, very accurate point. We don't know what's going to happen with this. <laughs> he sells gas for a lot cheaper than the people in North Carolina do, so he has an advantage. He also sells fireworks, illegal in North Carolina. He sells beer and wine, illegal in Gaston County. So we don't know how North Carolina, we, we, South Carolina feels it's North Carolina's problem. So anyway, but we, don't, we haven't been able to resolve that yet. But then you also have people that are being now told they live in North Carolina. This fellow again was told his entire subdivision was in South Carolina when he developed it. He also runs a water system for this subdivision. The office for his subdivision is here. He now has to deal with the act in South Carolina and the environmental agency in North Carolina. Oh, she ain't got a chance. So, I know. <laughs> so they're, they're trying to work that one out, so we only have to deal with one or the other. Okay, then there are these people. This, this couple right here moved from Raleigh, North Carolina after they retired. They get out of North Carolina. They didn't want to be in North Carolina anymore, so they bought this house. They're back in North Carolina. <laughs> so right now the Attorney General's offices for both states are working on legislation to resolve issues that are affecting people. Uh, taxes for one, education, and so forth and so on. Yes, ma'am? Can you tell me exactly where this is? Because I grew up there, within um, a couple miles of there. <coughs> it's, about, it's about seven miles west of Lake Wiley. I grew up on uh, the Catawba River. Right. Near between Fort Mill and Rock Hill. Okay, and but this no, this is west of this is west of Lake Wiley, about seven miles. Near Tigger Patty. Uh, 
Oh, no, T and K is way east yet. Oh. Anyway, so as I say, right now the Attorney Generals are working on legislation, taxes, uh, education. Uh, yes, sir. Wouldn't it be easier for both states to agree on a boundary change? Uh, okay. If you, wanted, if, if you wanted to change the boundary, okay, number one is you'd have to you'd have to determine where the boundary is going to go. Number two is it's got to go to Congress. Congress is the only power that can change the state boundaries. So, and people say, well, why, why don't you just leave it the way these people are doing? Why don't you just leave it the way it is? Uh, why change it? Because, well, number one is we have problems because nobody knows where the boundary is, really. Um, and it, we're having these problems. If we did this 25 years ago, we wouldn't have all these problems. I mean, if, if not, none of this stuff is here. But if you do it 50 years from now, just think of the increased problems you're going to run into as far as affecting people because there's going to continue to be development along the boundary. So we just got, we're the ones that got stuck with it or have to put up with it. So uh, this is, there are, and this is, this is the, this, this is the worst scenario. The, the rest of where we're affecting people on the boundary, it's not as, anywhere near as bad as this. So, um, the next section we did was going down the, uh, what was the Catawba River back in 1772. This is now what's called Lake Wiley. It was Lake Catawba back in 1904 when it was created. Um, and the dam, and that was Catawba Power Company, it became Southern Power Company, and then it became New Power Company. And um, again, we did not find this stone. So, but the center of the channel, uh, the Catawba River, was the boundary. Uh, so we had a boat again, and we did a hydrographic survey. We used old topographic maps that showed the original uh, uh, channel uh, that we used as reference to try and plan our uh, cross sections. Uh, we did surveys that recorded the depth, the position, and the time simultaneously. And this is lake level. This is one of the uh, cross sections uh, going along the lake. This is the channel. We used the formula to calculate the midpoint of the channel. Um, we, used, we did 400 cross sections across there. Uh, we, used, we used 170 of those to create um, the boundary from the uh, fort, North Fork of the Catawba River, down to where the boundary from the Catawba Indian Reservation comes out of there. Um, many people think the boundaries in the middle of the lake. <coughs> this is not true because the uh, river <coughs> snaked back and forth, and depending upon the geography of the area, and how to determine how the lake flooded as far as, in this case, up here, the boundary is very close to North Carolina. Uh, it comes in the middle of the lake here, changes all the way along there. Most people up there who are fisher people, fishermen, carried licenses for both states because they didn't want to get arrested by being fishing in the wrong state. So the wildlife official didn't know where the boundary was, basically. We had two homicides that we had to deal with on here. They didn't know what the jurisdiction was, so we had to deal with that. So there are jurisdictional problems, too. But now both the um, Department of Natural Resources uh, and, and both states have, have the coordinates. Again, these are all coordinates on these points have the coordinates for the boundary and they have them in their GPS systems on their boats so they know where their boundary is. Um, the next section we did was around the Catawba Indian Reservation and then the, and the 1813 section. Uh, the 1813 section we just used the best of the available, the oldest best available uh, records that we could as far as land records were concerned. This is the original survey for the Catawba Indian Reservation that was done by Samuel Wiley in 1764. There's 15 miles on the side, basically, 144,000 square acres. 
Uh, this was done again in 1764. By about 1825, the Catawbas had leased about 50% of that acreage to white settlers. And uh, by 1840, uh, basically, it was all gone. Uh, the state of South Carolina stepped in because uh, many of the white settlers were either not paying their lease money or they were cheating the Indians. So the South Carolina uh, government decided to buy the Cobb Indian Reservation and buy some land in North Carolina where they could live. North Carolina didn't want the Catawbas, so that plan fell through. So the Catawbas were going to move west where the other like the Cherokees and Uri and so forth. The Indians out there didn't want them because they'd have to share land and government resources with the Catawbas. So that fell through. So uh, the governor of South Carolina said, well, the Catawbas are basically the fault. They no longer exist as a nation. So that was the end of that. Well, that was the end of that until 19, about 1990, 1980, earlier than that, when the Catawbas sued, they sued. And uh, they and South Carolina wound up paying $50 million uh, to keep that land except for one, one square mile there. Um, and the ruling was that South Carolina in 1840 did not have the jurisdiction, did not have the power to enter into a treaty agreement with an Indian nation. Only the federal government had the power. And they didn't pay them either. Right. That, and they, that, they, that they never approached the matter. They didn't get paid by the state of South Carolina for the land. And so then it was probably in the 70s, in the mid 70s when that started. Yeah, and nobody had clear land titles for a long time, and it, it played water for a long time. Right. Um, when uh, Jean Bratton was doing uh, the research for us, uh, she did that 1772 uh, grant research. but. Jean was uh, working on this area for us as far as the land record was concerned. And she discovered that just like in 1772, South Carolina reissued land grants to those settlers because it was a little iffy in that situation. That South Carolina reissued what they called warrants to those settlers who leased land and now claimed land in that area. And they had plats that uh, with plats that they put along with warrants and Gene found that most of these warrants still existed so you can sort of put together a picture puzzle the situation of the, of the boundary. This is the boundary between the North Carolinas here, South Carolinas here for this particular warrant. So we had some good evidence of where to reestablish that boundary going around the Catawba Indian Reservation. The next section that we did was uh, 1764 section. Um, the area between, uh, again, this is a stone that was sitting there in 1813. Uh, this, above Lancaster and Chesterfield County, we went on the best available land records uh, evidence that we had, the oldest land records evidence. Marlboro County was a little different situation there. Again, this is the, uh, this is where the Salisbury Road came in on the western end of that uh, line. Again, they had wild trees but we have no, there was no evidence from any of the uh, land records for those anymore. Uh, again, this is the eastern end point, that one where they failed to get up to the 35th parallel. Again, they had a stake, quite a little stake on the northwestern end point. This goes back to the 1905 boundary survey. Uh, Roger Barnes with the North Carolina Geodetic Survey was working on a project on the uh, Richmond, Scotland, uh, county boundary in North Carolina, and one day somebody walked up to him and said, have you ever seen this map? And he said, no. And he asked me, and I said, I've never seen it. I've never heard about it. This was, this was the plat of the 1905 boundary survey that was done between Marlboro County and then Richland, Scotland County, North Carolina. Didn't even know the center of the stone, so I had to go back to research it out. We did find the records in the back of the house Senate records. So they, they set monuments. Uh, they were going to do it every mile, but they decided that most of them fell in areas where people would never see them. So they decided to put the monuments by uh, the roadsides and also by railroad tracks. Uh, 
And so we went to look for these uh, monuments. They, uh, surveyors at that time, 1905, did find that uh, white wood knot that was set in the hillside back in 1737. It was still there. And that, this is that white wood knot again, it's repeating. And they, re they put a new monument there. It's a granite monument. This is the North Carolina side, the other side is the South Carolina side. The other monument is about six feet tall. The other monuments are about seven inches on the side. Yeah. Uh, 1905 on the top, uh, North Carolina on one side, South Carolina on the other side. And uh, these are the monuments that we did find for this 1764 section. Uh, there was one uh, monument that was on an old plat that we were able to uh, determine coordinates for it uh, and uh, other property records that it was tied to the monuments. Uh, I had a question about this survey because it was only done between Marlboro County and Scotland and Richmond County and I couldn't figure it out. Why would they just do this? So I went back and read all the old Bennettsville, South Carolina newspapers and so forth that were, that were in the archives of the Carolina Library. Found out that Marlboro County was a dry county since 1826. And at this time in 1905, you know, prohibition was a big thing. Temperance was a big thing. And there were a lot of wine bars and stills in Marlboro County up in this area, and the good citizens of Marlboro County, or the good citizens of Marlboro County, wanted to get rid of these. So they wanted to know where the state line was and see if they were in South Carolina. If they were in South Carolina, they were going to get rid of them. So they had the line surveyed. They passed them. They got a legislature to pass a law saying we're going to survey the line there. They got a friend of theirs in North Carolina to do the same thing, so the line was surveyed in 1905. This is one of the stills that was in Marlboro County, 1905. This is Lackey still. He took the still apart, and moved it to North Carolina. <laughs> there are also line bars, a, a line what they call line bars or line rooms, uh, where people could just buy drinks. Um, one fellow was enterprising. He took his line bar, moved it one foot north of the new survey line, so people from Marlboro County could come and buy drinks reach over and buy their liquor. And there was another, there was another fellow that uh, the constables from South Carolina came up one day and they found seven barrels of whiskey in his barn and they were confiscated and he said, no, that's North Carolina. So the constables called back to Bennettsville to the uh, editor of the newspaper because he's also the surveyor for the state boundary and asked him where the boundary was in that area. And he said that it ran between the guy's barn and the guy's house. So when South Carolina came up, the whiskey was in the barn, when North Carolina people came, the whiskey was in his house. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyhow. Uh, so this next section that we did, again, was the 1905 boundary. Uh, we're looking for those monuments again. And these are the monuments that we were able to locate to reestablish that line. Um, that was that was fun. To yeah. And then the next section was between Dillon County, South Carolina, and, and Robeson County, North Carolina. Um, it was this was the came from the 1735, 1737 era. Uh, we didn't have, we did the best we could as far as getting the oldest land records we could. Uh, there wasn't much being affected here. Most of it's uh, uh, tree farms and so forth. However, for this section, North Carolina did make one stipulation. South Carolina would keep south of the board, <laughs> not be north. <laughs> anyway. And we and we did. There's only a tiny bit of one building from south of the border that's in North Carolina. So the last section is uh, between Ori and Brunswick. Bumps County is not gone. Um, this was done in 1928. Again, this is sort of the reason this was done is reminiscent of uh, the Georgia, South Carolina. Uh, 
boundary situation. Um, the tax on a bushel of clams in North Carolina is 20 cents a bushel. South Carolina is 8 cents a bushel. So North Carolina clam fishermen would come down to South Carolina to raid clam from South Carolina. Well, wildlife officials arrested a couple guys one time. They overpowered the wildlife officials and got back to North Carolina. The game warden, the chief game warden for both states decided that we didn't want to get any violence involved in, a, in this situation. So uh, they just persuaded both legislatures to pass a law so that they would be surveyed as uh, boundary. Originally, they were only going to do it in that inland to the Waccamaw River because uh, it's just along the coast where the clams are, but they decided to go all the way up to the Lumber River. And this is a copy of a plat that was done in 1928. <coughs> uh, monuments were set. Um, they're grand monuments, eight uh, feet long. They're seven, eight inches on the side. Had NC on one side, SC on the other side. Uh, this is the one down in the uh, marsh near the, uh, on Goat Island near the coast. And this is the one that's in the Lumber River. You can see it. it's low water and high water. Sometimes you couldn't see what the boundary was if the water was too hot. Uh, again, this is our examples of the uh, milestones. Uh, South Carolina and the mileage, 26 in this case, they're set every two miles. North Carolina this side. There are a couple stones uh, that were moved that uh, we discovered, uh, particularly in areas where they built golf courses. The people that built golf courses thought it would be nice to put the stones near the fairways so they could tell the people they were hitting in North Carolina, South Carolina, or South Carolina, North Carolina. So we had to, we had to relocate the original positions for a couple of the stones and had to move them back. So that was an interesting situation. And there were uh, some special stones that were set. The Little Boundary House was a point on the original uh, survey done in 1735. Uh, the surveyors in 1928 found the location of the uh, little boundary house and the rooms, confirmed it with the oldest living resident at that time, and that's what it was in some other records, and they put a special uh, monument at that particular point. They use this as one of the control points for the survey. They also thought that, well, maybe one of the original boundary trees was still alive. So as they surveyed inland, on a trial survey, they tried to look for trees that they thought might be. And uh, they got to one area about 31, you know, about 31 miles in, and there was a longleaf pine tree. It was barely alive, but it towered above everything else. Everything else around it had been cut a couple times and so forth. The uh, longleaf pine was hanging on, and it was almost dead, so they decided well, we're going to cut it down. So they cut it down and they sliced sections out of it. And they did find blaze mark, blaze marks in the tree. They counted the tree rings from the inside out, outside in, and came up with 1735, 1736. So this is the only lime tree on the boundary that was ever discovered. And, they, and a monument was set at that particular point also. So. Longleaf Pine still oh, exists. It still exists. This, uh, there are two pieces. One's in the North Carolina archives, the other one's in the South Carolina archives. Um, the surveyors for 1928 filed a piece of this in each state along with, this is part of the uh, official survey record. So it's filed with the survey record in the archives. And it's still there. You can go out and see it. Uh, this is a, this is the plat that now uh, shows the recovered monuments along that line. So we're fairly sure where that boundary is located. Again, there are coordinates on this plan. This is so. This this is the going from the first section that we did back in 1995, 1996. And we finally wound up in 2013 was the last uh, section that was approved. Um, these first two sections are have been enacted into law and approved by the North Carolina Council of State. 
But when we started getting into this, these sections uh, where we were affecting people, the uh, boundary commissioners from both states decided that we needed to uh, deal with uh, the effects on the residents and businesses along the boundary with legislation. So they only tentatively approved or conditionally approved those sections. Once the legislation is passed to deal with the issues, then we can enact these legal, the other sections legally. Uh, and the reason is, if we just enacted this legally, then there would, there would be no incentive to do anything for the people and the businesses. So, well, that's the law. That's it. You know, we can't do anything about it. So they're holding off on that until this legislation gets passed. This section is 334 miles, 333 miles long. I was done for a cost of about $2 million. No lawsuits. Compare that with Georgia, seven miles, $10 million. 25 years. This took us a good number of years, but we did it amicably and we did it. So, any questions? Yes, sir. How were they measuring miles in the 1700s and 1800s? Right, going to change? Accurately? No, no leave off that word. <laughs> well, yeah, for, their for their time. For their time. For their time. They had, they had a chain. They, 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 they had a chain. They dragged a chain and, and mark one end of the chain. And then uh, they drag it again. The, the other two guys, one each in, 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 in reverse positions, and that's how they measure distances. So the distances aren't accurate like we have now. On a long chain. No, no. <laughs> so they were just doing short sections. Yes, yes. Yes, sir. Well, the exception where that gas station is, is the accuracy fairly good in comparing what they did in the 1700s versus what we're doing now? Is the accuracy reasonably good? Okay. Remember what I said, that we we're supposed to follow in the footsteps of the original surveyors the right. best we could. So we're trying to replicate their work. The boundary's always where it's been. It's never changed. The perception where the boundary is has changed. But uh, that, that's changed. But where the boundary is, it's always been there. We're, and we're just, we're just trying to reestablish what it was back on those surveys. How close we are actually to what they did, we don't know because we don't have we don't have the original records for all the time. Yes, sir. What's the southernmost point on that section of the Catawba River? You know the location? A little the, purple line? On the wait, on the Catawba? In York, yeah, Catawba? right there, right there where the. Okay, I don't I don't know what the coordinate would be. I could get it for you. Uh, yeah. uh, off the top of my head. Is it uh, um, in reference to like uh, Highway 21? Is that is it part, the end of Lake Wiley, or is it part of the river? Or that's part of the river. Okay. Uh, it's part of no, no. That's that's part of Lake Wiley. The, the whole thing's Lake Wiley. Okay, so yeah. so below the Lake Wiley Dam would be in the Catawba Indian Reservation. Yeah. 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 But what was the Catawba? Right. If you're familiar with Lake Wiley, if you're familiar with Lake Wiley, that point where the purple stops and goes into the blue is at the mouth of uh, it's the northern end of Tinker County. Okay. It's right, it's right at that island. This is the mouth. Yeah, I was born right there, right. Where are you talking about? Right. Right, right at that purple blue yeah. that's, that's, that, It runs through part of that island. It's in the north. I have a question for y'all. I, I came up to a car. I started working for the geodetics for me. That's say 95. But I was working with the geological survey. And did a bunch of work up here in the early 80s. And then when I worked with Geodetic Survey, we did some geodetic projects up here. And anybody, does anybody know where this is? 
This is a cemetery when I was doing a genetic project and sitting on a station one time. I went by, I just snapped some shots real quick, and this was back in the 1990s, late 90s, and I can't remember where I was. Uh, but they were so unusual, the, the, the tunes were so unusual, and I didn't. And when I found the pictures again, I kicked myself because I didn't write anything on the back of them either. That's not Liberty Church, is it? I don't know. Yeah, we live we live off of Cleveland Pike, and there's a very, very old church. How old is that church? 1805. 1805, and they have things like that in the cemetery. Okay. Cleveland Pike goes back anybody? up towards Tugelo at uh, the old Prather's Bridge site. Right. Yeah, right. This is the boundary. So if you were working that area. We're two miles away from the Georgia line. That I think I was down there. Yeah, I think I was, I think I was down there. It's a road called Cleveland Pike off 123. Okay. Liberty Church. Liberty Church old built in. Old Liberty Church. Oh, yeah, Old Liberty Church. There's also those kind of burials at the Illinois Baptist Church Cemetery. Pickens County. Pickens County. Because people come to take photos. That's the only four pictures you've had. Yep. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> is that a road? Is that a road behind? Yes, sir. In the first one? Yes, sir. Is that a paved road? road? Or you remember it? Be on Liberty. <laughs> because the high old Le Cleveland Pike looks just like that. Behind, I mean, the, the road lines up. Could be there before they cleaned it up. Okay. Well, that's, that's better than I can do, <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate it. I'd like to go back there sometime. Check that. But it looks like that's the majority of the cemetery. It doesn't look like a huge cemetery. Mm -hmm. No, it wasn't a huge cemetery. No modern songs, so that's all it was. As far as I remember, that's all it was. Yeah. So, so Illinois and the because old Liberty, Liberty Church, Liberty. that it's been an ongoing church, and they now have modern stones in there along with it. Okay. But there's a maybe, section. Maybe, of the, maybe I just didn't pay attention to those because I was so taken with this. But there's a section of the cemetery that's very old like that that hasn't been touched. But they've cleaned everything else up. Mm -hmm.